Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. This podcast is in partnership with Evergreen Podcasts. And every week we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandy. In this week's episode, I welcome Andy Brown, a former Scottish police officer with 30 years of service, mostly in the Highlands and Islands. He delves into the intricacies of negotiation and crisis management, sharing valuable lessons from his extensive career, 15 years of which he served as a crisis and hostage negotiator. Andy discusses the importance of a negotiation mindset, active listening, honesty, and trust. He recounts tense moments from his career, including negotiating with terrorists and facilitating evacuations during the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Andy also highlights the significance of maintaining mental health and shares personal practices such as meditation, walking in nature, and family support that have helped him stay grounded in highly stressful situations. Finally, Andy offers wisdom for young professionals entering first responder roles, emphasizing humility, empathy, and learning from experienced colleagues. Former commander, chief inspector, who's now retired, Andy Brown is an internationally renowned negotiator with specialist knowledge and experience in dealing with kidnap for ransom and hostage crisis incidents, particularly in humanitarian environments in designing conflict de-escalation skills for field operations and acting as an expert witness to judicial inquiries on the response to hostage taking. A fellow of the Chartered Management and Security Institutes, he has developed advanced negotiation and crisis leadership skills for major corporations, public bodies, and Olympic sports coaches. His doctoral studies and experiences in Afghan and African kidnappings have led him to research, critique, and advise NGOs on how to prepare, prevent, and respond to the threat of international kidnapping. As a Fulbright alumnus, he continues to teach advanced negotiation tactics to many law enforcement agencies, including NYPD, USMS, and the FBI. Published in his field, he remains an advisor to the editorial board of the Crisis Response Journal. I really hope you get a lot out of this episode, as I truly did. And before we jump into the episode, here's a brief word for one of our sponsors. As a mental health practitioner, one of the first things I focus on is sleep. Sleep can be really important for our recovery and our focus and performance. This is why Easy Conversations has partnered with Newcom. Why Newcom? Newcom is just not another wellness product. It's a pioneer and leader in the field of neuroscience and brain health with over three decades of dedicated research and innovation. Unlike any other product on the market, Newcom is recognized for its unique combination of patented technology and clinically proven results that truly set it apart. Newcom can help you not only manage your sleep through its neuroscientific breakthroughs, but It can help you to relax quickly, safely, and reliably. The clinically proven solution relaxes individuals without drugs, without delay, and without fail. Listeners of this podcast can get a free trial of Newcom today. Go to newcom.com, that's N-U-C-A-L-M.com slash free trial, and use the code EASY at checkout. Start making your sleep a priority because it is the most easiest thing we can use to improve our performance and our ability to focus. All right, Andy, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me. Uh, at least on my end, it's morning, afternoon on your end, but I appreciate you making the time. And I know we've chatted prior to this, but one of the things that I really want to uncover is not only the idea of negotiations, because as I mentioned to you, I think everything in life is a negotiation, but there's yeah. a, an aspect of it that allows you to be successful in the negotiation and your, the mindset you go in. And I think a lot of people feel like compromise is often I'm giving up too much, but you have to look at the bigger yeah. pie, right? One of the things that I've learned from a mentor when it comes to negotiations is maximizing the pie, right? 
And that's something I want to discuss with you, but also understand in the type of negotiations you've been involved in, because that requires a different level of mindset and how you've been able to manage your own mental health, which is obviously very crucial in all aspects of life. But before we get into all of that, I do want to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself, what's brought you here and what you're doing right now. Okay, thanks fucking thanks very much for the invite. My name is Andy Brown. I spent 30 years of my life as a police officer in Scotland. I served mainly in the Highlands islands of Scotland. So I worked in really remote communities. I'm probably a bit of an old-fashioned style of policing to what you're used to across the pond. I'm very proud that I've never had to carry a gun in 30 years of policing. Uh, which mm -hmm. I think is quite remarkable given the mm -hmm. society we live in nowadays. And throughout that career, I did lots of different training. Uh, and one of the fields that I really enjoyed and I was a natural fit for me was as a crisis and hostage negotiator. I did that for half of my career uh, and got involved mainly in, in a lot of suicide intervention uh, where people got to the point where the only solution that they thought in their head was to take their own life. Uh, and, and as we know, uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult area uh, in which to engage somebody. But when you do engage in, with somebody in that in that space, you can make a significant difference. And I've, I've helped people throughout my life, even prior to my police career. Uh, and I'm quite, I think I've been blessed with the natural ability to be calm under a lot of pressure and to have a lot of common sense in terms of the approach and to be able to block out a lot of the societal noise we live in nowadays uh, and yeah. to be able to see clearly in terms of how to help that individual or, or group of people. And my experience working in policing, particularly in remote communities where you are part of the community, very much taught me a lot of life skills, I would have to say that are very pertinent within negotiation. And at the end of my career, uh, I had a good friend who was a doctor who said to me, what are you going to do? If I said, there's a beer on the front line, you have a buzz from helping people. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to go and play golf as most retired police officers do. And I went, no. I said, uh, I don't enjoy golf because uh, yeah. I'm not very good at it. So. I said, I like helping people. Uh, and he says, well, you can find a, a role that allows you to help people without being on the front line. He said, I think that would be good. Fortuit quite fortuitously through my negotiation work, I fell into humanitarian work uh, and I'm still in that space just now. Thank you for sharing all of that. And that's amazing in terms of what you've been able to do. And I find it interesting to be a police officer without having a gun because then that would force you to rely more on negotiating as well, rather than resorting to having that backup and knowing that it's there. You almost have to completely rely on your ability to talk to people and have yeah. those conversations as you've shared. Now, you've also shared some of other extreme situations where you've had to help people evacuate certain difficult circumstances. And yeah from a negotiation standpoint. So just before we get into some of those details, at a high level for people that are either doing negotiations in their life as a yeah. career or just personally, or would like to learn more, what are some things that you can offer at the forefront in terms of things that we should all focus on when we're trying to work out a solution with the person or individuals across from us. So I, I, I think for can I, I said to this and you smiled the last time I mentioned it. God blessed us with two ears and one mouth. And if we learn to use them in that proportion, it makes a significant difference in terms of the basics. Mm -hmm. We all have the skills to be able to negotiate and to engage with people. Mm -hmm. Some of us are very good at it. Some of us have got to work at it. Some of us are quite challenged by that sort of environment. And I think for me, being able to actively listen to somebody, mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. really then to be genuinely interested in what they are saying is massively key. 
honesty. Yes. Uh, we all know that uh, being honest sometimes can get you into hot water. Being right at the wrong time is not always popular, but that honesty, people appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Even if that is a difficult message to receive. And and as humans, we <clears throat> can tend to want to test each other. Mm-hmm. So part of that testing regime is is about testing to see if you're honest. Mm-hmm. And as you know, if you're, if you're caught lying to somebody in a negotiation, then your, your trust is out the window. Uh, I say to people that trust arrives on a donkey and disappears on a racehorse. So there's a lot of work in building that trust up and it's our ability to listen to people mm-hmm. so that our person should be doing most of the talking and we should be doing most of the listening mm-hmm. in terms of listening to try and understand what the key issue is because some people might not always share that initially. And when they emphasize particular words or use keywords, you think, okay, what does that mean? to use open-ended questions to maybe drill down uh, into what the key issue is, to understand the motivations behind it and the emotions behind it, because most of the decisions we make uh, are emotional ones. And then once you've understood the issue, is not to solve it for the person, because we're all great at problem solving, Yeah, to find the solution themselves. And if the person finds the solution themselves, they are more likely to carry out the solution to the issue that they have. And my role as a negotiator is to support them in that process. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and one of the things you touched on, I've heard Chris Voss, who wrote the book, Never Split the Difference, he's talked about it quite a bit too, where he says, your integrity is your currency, essentially, in, in the negotiation, right? So that's what I'm hearing from you is that honesty yeah. piece is so crucial because that trust takes a really long time to build, but it could be gone in a very quick second or whatever you may put out there and the other person will lose trust if if you're not being completely honest. But now there's another level of negotiations that you've been a part of with respect to hostage negotiations. Are you able to shed some light on that just from your personal experience, the emotional attachment that comes in with that and what are some things you've had to rely on for yourself to navigate through those negotiations? So, yeah, I've been involved in quite a few hostage negotiations, uh, some domestic, some international, some terrorist. So it's the pattern doesn't really change. A lot of people are frightened uh, by the prospect of having to negotiate with terrorists. Sometimes negotiating with your own children is more challenging. Uh, when they're going through various stages of, in life. So for me, it's about being rooted in reality and being rooted in the moment. For me, it's when somebody is taken as a hostage, which invariably is a commodity, to bargain for ransom or for another instrumental thing. What tends to happen is the people who know the individual taken are very emotional and are very emotionally attached to that individual because of their relationship to that individual. So they tend to follow a roller coaster in terms of there's a little bit of hope in the information that comes in and suddenly they're, they're elated, they can great, we've almost got that person out. And then mm-hmm. suddenly it happen, and then they go from being high emotionally with lots of hope to suddenly being quite depressed and uh, almost in despair. And my role is to try and guide a a fairly level path through that roller coaster of emotions to be, to base ourselves on what are the facts of the issue, not what we think we know, but what we actually know. So basing our thinking and decision-making on factual information, Mm -hmm. which is sometimes difficult to get, but also be able to record where we are. So at the beginning of a negotiation, it's very easy to, to forget recording where you are and all the various things you've done. Yeah. But if you record where you are at the beginning and then fast forward I mean, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, every week where you are in that negotiation, you can actually see the progress you're making in terms mm-hmm. of the dialogue with the other side. 
Uh, and for me, one of the things, and, and I've learned this because I, I work with a, a deep faith organization, I don't think society is very good at discernment. Mm. So we're not very good at standing back and saying, okay, what's the bigger picture here? How might this play out? And we tend to be pressured by society, by the mm -hmm. expectations of others. And perhaps the biggest challenge, particularly with, within the setting that I've worked, is mm -hmm. keeping us outside your negotiation cell, keeping them informed, but at almost at arm's length. So that they won't put too much pressure on you to allow yeah. you to carefully craft what you're going to say, uh, what information you glean in the negotiation, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. you can quickly navigate that to a to a peaceful resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that because I know in general, like when we're emotional, we're not able to fully practice our full judgment, right? So our executive functioning gets compromised when our emotions get in the way. But it could be tough in a lot of these situations that you're referring to that you've been involved in. So I guess a larger question, but first would be, how do you keep yourself grounded? And then what are some things you've done in general in your life and you still continue to do to put your mental health at the forefront and prioritize it? What are some things that have allowed you to stay grounded? Because you're obviously in these stressful situations, yeah. how do you manage all of that when you're behind the scenes? Yeah, so so life life has got a funny way of teaching you lessons. Uh, and when I was in my early my early fifties, uh, I I suffered from quite bad health. I and suddenly that invincibility you have as a, as a cop disappeared, yeah. Uh, yeah. and that let me tell you that that puts you on your backside. Mm -hmm. uh, very much ground you, and that uh, led me to a conversation where somebody said to me, "Andy, I think you need to learn how to meditate." And I, I scoffed at the idea of thinking, no, "I don't need to do that." Uh, I'm a sort of tough guy. I'm Scottish, and I don't need that nonsense. And then I thought about it, and I went off and I learned how to meditate. And the guy who was teaching me said, "Why have you chosen to do this?" I said, "I'm coming to the end of a." a 30-year career in the police and I want to live my life differently because I've dealt with lots of stressful situations. You see the good and bad in life when you're a police officer mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to embrace my life with a little bit more grace. As mm -hmm. being policing, you is very task-driven. You deal with a lot of conflict and you mm -hmm. deal with that and then you process that and the consequence of that is, is like many cops, I've had a couple of divorces. Uh, mm. That's a painful life chapter to go through, but it's helped to shape me who I am. Mm -hmm. that, that learning how to meditate was massively important. Uh, my father-in-law asked, uh, as an Orthodox Christian, if I would go to Mount Athos to spend time with the monks. I did that. I meditated a lot and I prayed a lot. And I think that gave me a different perspective uh, on life yeah that allowed me to probably discern a bit more uh, and not to be able to shut out a lot of the noise and I think some of the experiences that I've had I was I was heavily involved uh, back in 2021 when the military forces withdrew from Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, taken over uh, by the Taliban uh, and we worked uh, almost night and day to, to be able to manage to, to evacuate some of Afghan staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now settled in many different countries around the world uh, and having a life that is free from persecution. So that was a huge amount of stress. Uh, and one of the girls in our office in Rome said to me, Andy, how do you manage stress? Yeah. And I said, okay, probably three things. The number one, I spend a lot of time in nature, so I go walking with my faithful dog up, up the mountains every day. It's my good exercise, it's my quiet time, it's my time in nature, uh, which I mm -hmm. find restorative. But it also gives you that clear thinking space. Secondly, my, my wife is uh, Greek Cypriot, 
uh, I, I'm convinced that she's got Spartan genes. She's, she's very loving, but she's very tough. So, and I need yeah. a woman to, to keep me on track. So I'm very fortunate uh, to have her. Uh, and the last one was the Minions. During the evacuation of uh, Afghanistan, we were working almost 24-7. My daughter uh, was, was five at the time, just about to, to start school. And I had just, in that early morning, managed to get 30 Afghans out of Kabul airport on a military aircraft. And she said to me, she said, Daddy, can we watch the Minions? Mm. I sat down, we cuddled up on the sofa, and I sat and watched the Minions. And for me, that loving family support uh, is massively important. Uh, and it's helped me because they recognise when oh, dad's a bit stressed, so let's go and do something completely different. Mm. So these three things uh, I have hit, found have helped me massively. Uh, and I must admit, I didn't probably take care of myself that much as a cop. Mm -hmm. I was fit for my work, but did really take care of myself to a high extent. So since finishing, I focused on that, which allows me to be in a position to deal with mm -hmm. some of the challenges that I have to deal with it in my humanitarian work. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing all that. And I think even in your story there with the minions, there's that relief there through humor, but also recognizing that outside of, I think outside of that stress, we still need to come back to the present moment and recognize what's more important. And that's what I'm hearing from what you're sharing here also. Now, I just out of curiosity, what has been the toughest negotiation that you've been a part of? Because there are certain situations where you don't see the way out or you realize that maybe I'm not going to get to the end result I'm hoping for, or this is just a conversation or a negotiation I can't even conduct because of the other side. Have you ever experienced that? And what was that like for you to work through? I've dealt with terrorist negotiations. I actually find them relatively businesslike. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the toughest thing was the chaos during the boot, taking staff out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was, I've experienced plenty of chaos in my life yeah. uh, as a cop. But this was on a completely different level. Uh, I had people that I had worked with for a long time that I knew. Mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm. the family, knew the kids. Uh, so I was emotionally attached to them. I had staff on the ground who were telling me, oh, nothing to see here. This is just Afghanistan. You don't understand. And I'm saying, mm -hmm. no, this is all the intelligence is telling me it's going to be really bad. And so navigate, be able to navigate that. And during that time, like many other organizations, it, it was frustrated about not being able to get people inside Kabul airport mm -hmm. to get people out. Yeah. Uh, it was quite fortuitous and where our offices in Rome, uh, we're very close to the Holy See. Mm -hmm. uh, I have relationships with the Holy See. Uh, mm -hmm. And through that, that, that relationship, uh, we were able to speak to an ambassador and then that very quickly moved on to being able to speak to the U.S. Marine Corps who were in charge of the security and then being able to facilitate basically a military extraction. Uh, for our staff. Uh, and that, that was at a really difficult time. So once we had that conversation with the ambassador, we were then able to basically organize uh, with the U.S. Marine Corps a military extraction. Uh, to be able to get a lot of our staff inside Kabul airport and safe point of flights out of Kabul. Mm -hmm. I went through, it was very early in the morning, I went through and, and said to uh, Katerina, uh, my, my wife, I said, oh, good, good news, we got 30 of them. They're on a plane, they're heading out to safety. Mm -hmm. She said, how do you feel? And I busted crying. Uh, in 30 years of policing, I had never cried. Mm. which is quite common. Uh, and she goes, okay, that was, okay, get yourself together, Andy, let's, because it was still ongoing. We still had lots and lots of staff and it was still chaotic. Mm -hmm. Time out. Uh, my daughter started primary one 
uh, on the day after we'd done that. So I'd just be like a parent and say, everything's fine and just do that. Mm -hmm. And conversations in, uh, with the ambassador were, because we were told, you know, you've had your shot, uh, you're only getting 30 people out. Uh, and I'm going, no, we've got lots of people to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I wasn't taking no as an answer. So I pressed with the, the priest I was working with and in my great admiration uh, of my colleague, Father David spoke to the ambassador and he didn't ask, he relayed a situation when he had been the country director in South Africa during some of the really difficult times in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But he was to the situation that he thought was completely impossible. And one of the tribal elders had reached out and had touched him in the forearm and said, Father, sometimes you need to be like Jesus and learn to walk in water. Mm -hmm. now, he had relayed this to the ambassador and then put the phone down. And he phoned me and told me what he'd done. I went, oh, okay, we'll see what happens there. <laughs> and then three, four o'clock in the morning, we got a call saying, he's basically said, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And because we had prepared, we were good to go. Uh, we had people in the crowd and, and different groups who were all identified and, and ready to move. We were able to get an additional 65 in at Abbey Gate before the suicide uh, bombing from uh, ISIS-K, which unfortunately killed 13 US service personnel and again I went back through to Katrina because it was early in the morning and she said how are you and I burst out crying again I said we've just managed to get 65 in mm -hmm. the gates uh, and they're all heading out to Italy and it's just okay and when we when the whole thing was finished it was about where do the remaining staff go mm -hmm. so how did they reintegrate back into a country that had enjoyed to a large extent democracy for 20 odd years mm -hmm. and then suddenly with some of the Afghans said dragged back to the dark ages so it was being able to say I've done my best uh, I took a we took a holiday as a family went to the Yorkshire Moors and to the countryside yeah uh, and we spent time as at that little nucleus as a family very much off social media off phones and laptops mm -hmm. just to basically spread nature and I found the nature very restorative and one of the things that I have learned working with deep faith organizations when sometimes it doesn't go your way that's just what it's meant to be mm -hmm. and I always remember my 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 grandmother telling me it's an old Scotch saying is that if it's for you, I won't go by you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it wasn't for you, then it wasn't meant to be. So, uh, that that type of wisdom, yeah, uh, which I think is invaluable, and it's how that sits with me. Yeah, uh, when I'm able to now not be as frustrated as I was probably as a cop, mm -hmm. but because of my faith and because of my I suppose my wisdom mm -hmm. that I've gained for the years, I'm able to deal with that. Whereas before I would probably as a young man be quite frustrated that I wasn't able to help every person. Mm -hmm. I think it's our ability to step back. Right. Yeah. Which a lot of us struggle with. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing that up because that was something I was going to ask is how do you manage to work through those situations where you know people got left behind and what I'm hearing from you is the ability to really, in your case, as you shared, and, and I relate to that, is the faith aspect of it, that it, yeah. if it wasn't meant for you, it's not going to come to you. And and then surrendering to that, that you've tried your best, but that was all what was in the cards. And that's very yeah. tough for people to accept and internalize. I, I, I think one of the things that we did, like many others did, uh, we had a list of people. We we had a selection criteria, uh, so that we we took uh, those who were at the most risk, uh, and were very clear on that. Uh, stuck to it, which I think is really important. Uh, and the ones we couldn't get out, there were remaining ten families on that list, 
and I moved them into Pakistan and subsequently over a two year period was able to get them out to different countries, which again was, is, was very difficult. And it's then being able to say, so we restarted our mission in Afghanistan. I, a lot of the former staff were then re-employed uh, and it's to restart that mission under a different regime, mm -hmm. which again is very challenging. So for me, it's when you stand back strategically and look at it on a more holistic basis, say, of the mission that's in Afghanistan, the activity around August 2021 was a blip and a change of government. Yeah. Uh, if you look at it from really high level, uh, on the ground level, it's it caused it's caused absolute chaos. Uh, and women that are in the country don't have rights, not allowed to be educated or to work, which wiped away almost a generation's worth mm -hmm. of of freedoms in terms of that the women enjoyed. So these things are hard to stomach. Mm -hmm. but when you stand back and look at it, you say, okay, that's maybe part of the life cycle of that country. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the one of the sayings that I love uh, is when we started the mission in Afghanistan back in 2005, uh, we went on the basis that if you go for a year, plant rice. If you go for 10 years, plant trees. Mm -hmm. If you go for 100 years, educate children. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, for me, one of the things that, that I'm very proud of is that all the work that we do in the humanitarian world is about education mm -hmm. and about educating the children, the next generation, that there is an answer yeah. that is not violent. Yes. That is about peace mm -hmm. and it's about reconciliation. It's about negotiation. And it's about accepting the differences and being able to navigate some of the challenges that life throws at you. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And one of the things you shared with me before was when you're negotiating with these people, you have to often keep their views and their rules in mind. But when it's a terrorist organization of that type and you know what they're capable of, how do you get to that point of being able to understand their views and rules when you know it's not rational, it's not moral, it's not ethical from many angles, right? So one of the things that, that I always do is, in, in the world that, that we operate in, there are there are certain characteristics you, you will see in negotiations. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, okay, right, they're using active listening skills. Right? They're making demands. And some of the language and how it's constructed and how it's conveyed as a message, you think, okay. And then if you deploy the tactics that you've been taught into that negotiation, and they're able to counter them, you then start to think, okay, these guys, okay. mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's about uh, the time that you devote to, to your craft as a negotiator. Uh, it's about you recognizing, being able to recognize these tactics that are being used against you and to be able to counter some of these tactics and navigate around that. And a lot of the, the ethical stuff is really important, but a lot of the ideology that they have and the processes they have in their mind they, these things are okay mm -hmm. in their mind they're not so it's able to recognize that difference and to use that uh, as a tool to say okay if they if this is their ideology and this is the way they behave that gives you tools in your toolbox to be able to culturally understand them mm -hmm. but also be able to negotiate within that space mm -hmm. because you can to a large extent start to anticipate what they will do yeah and if you can anticipate what you do you can then for me it's people talk about negotiation like mental chess and it's how to move the chess pieces very carefully within that conversation yeah yeah i know i can appreciate that it's not an easy task for sure but to your point you have to master the craft which is so crucial and i don't think a lot yeah. of people appreciate the other piece you touched on was in society today, I think you've made reference to, in general, the society we live in. But one of the things you, or a couple of things you touched on was, one, the ability to, knowing that we have two ears and one mouth, so 
being able to listen more. But the other thing you touched on was this inability to discern, which has become an issue. And we see this globally right now where there's so much polarization. Everyone has different views and we're trying to talk over each other. We're not understanding the other side. We're not finding common ground, which are all aspects of a negotiation. What do you yeah. suggest or what do you see as a problem? I guess we can focus on what's the problem here. And I know you've touched on it in different ways, but what's the solution coming out of this where you see all of this chaos everywhere in the world? Uh, you're seeing wars, you're seeing the ability to not, either party not to be able to come to a solution or even have a conversation that can move towards a solution. I, I think society is far more polarized now yeah. than it's ever been. I've certainly seen more and more conflict and it's how we navigate within that space. Yeah. What a lot of the times, even when I was a cop, a lot of the time I would bring parties that were not quite on the verge of criminality, but were, were falling out with each other over all the time. And I say, okay, how can I get these two parties into a room and to sit down and allow them to talk, to listen to each other. I, and part of the role as a negotiator and probably a mediator mm -hmm. is to be able to do that. Uh, and, and that's really tough. Mm -hmm. And you know, I spoke to a lady this morning in, in Cairo who was having a challenge with some of her mediation. And she says, when we get to a certain point, people flare up and they're very emotional and and very quickly goes to shouting and then violence. And I said to her, so do, okay, as a mediator, you set the ground rules yeah, in terms of what behavior is acceptable. And one of the, one of the things that I think we are probably missing in today's society is our ability to be graceful. We are bombarded with so much information. It's very difficult to understand whether that information is true or whether it's false. Mm -hmm. We've seen in a lot of conflicts that the media and social media is used as a weapon, basically, mm -hmm. to spread disinformation. And that can cause a breakdown in societies very quickly. Uh, and you see that right across Europe with the war in Ukraine just now. Yeah. Uh, so it's on a very fine balance. So the messaging really needs to be important, mm -hmm. but also it's just, it's the humility. Yeah. So I know from my experience when we set up a, a mission in Nigeria, uh, I think I told you the story, I took a small football and sat down and gave the kids a, a small football and they were playing soccer in the, in the refugee camp. And I sat with one of the mothers who was, she was crying and I said, I hope these are tears of happiness. Mm -hmm. She goes, yes, my sons are playing football. They're really happy and thank you so much for allowing them to play. Mm -hmm. and, and she says, but I'm also sad. And I said, but why are you sad? She said, I'm sad because I had two daughters and my daughters were murdered by Boko Haram mm -hmm. because they, just because they went to school. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, my daughter was three years old and suddenly you think, wow, it just gives you that humility and puts you uh, into that perspective. We're all human beings on this planet. We've got one planet uh, and we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. But we spend an awful lot of time not embracing our differences, but fighting against them. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had a little bit more grace, a little bit more humility, then that would allow us to get around the table and to have these and they are difficult conversations. They are honest. They are difficult. They are prickly, mm -hmm. full of emotion. Mm -hmm. When you allow people to be heard, which I think is really important, uh, so they feel heard and so they can express the emotions behind what's happened to them, then you start to be able to find some kind of path towards resolution. And a mediator and negotiator is there to help guide towards some kind of solution that's agreeable for both sides. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. That humility piece 
is so important because I don't think we talk about it enough. And part of the issue that you identified right at the beginning, the inability to listen, uh, because we're yeah. so worried about getting our word in or our opinion in, and that's where that humility is lacking. But if we took that approach, then we can actually open ourselves up to more perspectives and understanding of the fact that just because I have a certain experience or I've experienced certain things in life, which has allowed me to form certain opinions, doesn't mean that they're right because th those opinions are based on the things I've gone through. And also recognizing yeah. that we all have blind spots and we don't become aware of those blind spots unless we're willing to hear other perspectives. And that's where that humility also comes in to know that we can be wrong and that's okay too. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's that, I think our ability to be, just to demonstrate empathy mm -hmm. was, was really important. And just to take that, and it's literally a moment to think, wait a minute, why is that from behaving, behaving in that way? Mm -hmm. What's their backstory? What has brought them to this place to make them behave in this way? Yeah. And just take that time to listen to them. Uh, and if you do it well and you are genuine in that connection, you can make a huge difference to somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Huge thing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things I also want to ask you as we bring things to a close, because you've talked about your career in the police and you see a lot of younger people now joining these first line responding roles. What are your, like, what can you offer to these individuals based on some of the experiences you've had as they're going into these lines of work in terms of managing their emotions, their stress levels, their mental health, because you said that was not something that you had focused on. You had to learn through experiences. And because of the society we live in, I feel like the challenges have only grown uh, because everything we've talked about thus far, there's it's tougher to actually negotiate with people or even have a conversation. So what do you recommend to these younger folks that are going into these professions in terms of managing their stress and how they can focus on some of the things that perhaps get neglected. One of the, one of the things that I thought was, was really funny when I, when I first started in the police mm -hmm. was I'd been to college, I'd been to the academy, I'd done all the training. Uh, I came out of the academy, I was really fit, really smart. And just, I was, I was so eager to get going. Uh, and then my senior cop said to me, now you've been to college, that's fine. You've done all that stuff. Well done. This is the real job. Yeah. And for me, it's a little bit tribal, uh, but it's listening to the elders mm -hmm. within the organization. And some of these elders might say, oh, the job's terrible. It wasn't what it was like 50 years ago, all that sort of stuff. And you will always get that. But in their comments, there is a wisdom. So for me, it's about listening to that wisdom, mm -hmm. not necessarily acting on it, but listening to it. Mm -hmm. I remember the first fight that we went to, I was driving the van and my senior cop said to me, no, just take your time. I said, but we need to get there. It's an emergency. He goes, yes, take your time. Mm. It's a fight outside a pub. There's at least five men involved. If we take our time, then by the time we get there, they'll be tired. Mm. Yeah, for makes your job a lot bit easier. I'm thinking, oh, okay, yeah, there, there is a bit of wisdom to that. Yeah. For me, it's it listen to that wisdom. Uh, what I think is really important is within organizations, particularly the emergency services, uh, that internal culture, what they call the black humor, mm -hmm. the dark humor, that has its place, mm -hmm. uh, but that needs to be appropriate. So if you're comfortable with it and it's appropriate, that's fine. If you're not comfortable with it, you say something because mm -hmm. that's really important. And that's for me, that's about professionalism. Mm -hmm. And one lesson that I think is really important that stayed with me all my life is treat others as you would expect to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, and this goes back to treating that ability to be grace when you, you deal with some really difficult individuals who are either on drugs or on alcohol who sometimes fight like wild animals mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's just to take a moment to say, okay, oof, that was really difficult. Yeah. But just just to think, okay, well, why, why are they in that space? Mm-hmm. What's brought them to that space? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to learn, to be constantly learning when you're in that, when you're in any of these professions. Mm-hmm. And to listen. I can guarantee you most of the people who go to meetings go with their own agenda in their head, say, I want to see this. Uh, if they do that, they tend not to listen. Mm-hmm. And the most effective people in the meeting are the man or woman that's sitting in the corner not saying very much, right. but listening. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly something they go, wow, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. Because they have listened to the topics that are being discussed in the meeting. So for me, listening is your superpower. Uh, uh, being empathic with people is really important. But taking the wisdom uh, from the elders, which I know having worked in Africa quite a bit, uh, I've been told on many occasions I've got a deep well of wisdom. <laughs> so for, for me, is dipping into that wisdom and saying, okay, right, what would you do here? Yeah. And not being frightened to ask the, what I would call the daft laddie questions mm-hmm. and to say, what do you think we should do here? Mm-hmm. And listening to wisdom. So I, I think that's really important. I know the younger generation tend to move from career to career probably more often than I did, mm-hmm. uh, whereas you know, being a cop was a vacation. So it's to stand again, stand back and say, what do you want to do? Who do you want to be? Or who are you? I think these are some of the difficult questions to ask in your life is, who am I and who? What do I want to mm-hmm. do? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's taken me into my fifties to to discover that. Yeah, I appreciate that because that answer evolves too, right? Who am I? Yeah, changes with time based on the experiences we go through in life and some of the choices we make. And everything I've heard from you is a lot of these choices allow us to grow, and there's nothing wrong with that. Every lesson that we can take and grow from, so. I appreciate all of that and definitely I've taken a lot from this conversation in terms of the wisdom you've offered. So I definitely see that. So thank you so much, Andy, for your time and sharing your lessons with us and some of the work you've been able to do and some of the experiences you've had. But for listeners, if they want to learn more about some of this humanitarian work you're doing or would like to reach out to you if that's an opportunity. What are some ways they can do that? I, I, I put some of my experience and some of the things that I've been involved in uh, on, a, on a website, uh, which is it's just like a, a shop window. Uh, and that is called uh, The Right Path. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll share that at, uh, link with you. Yes. Uh, so the viewers, and I'm happy to I'm happy to chat to anybody on LinkedIn uh, and they can find me on LinkedIn. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes, but uh, Andy, thank you so much again for your time and uh, coming and having this conversation with me. Yeah. And thank you very much for for getting up early to host me. (laughs) Thank you for checking out this episode with Andy. As always, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support this podcast. And on Apple and Spotify, you can leave up to a five-star review. These reviews are really helpful and appreciated as they allow us to improve the quality of the show. You can also check out the sponsors in the description and check out evergreenpodcast.com for their network of podcasts, including Easy Conversations. And finally, please subscribe to the Easy Reflections newsletter, a zero-cost newsletter that goes out weekly where I talk about different mental health topics and share some practical tips and tricks that people can apply. Thank you again, and until next time.